Future trading involves risk and is not suitable for all investors. Content provided in this segment is meant for educational purposes and is not a solicitation to buy or sell commodities. Kind of on the back side of a discussion of rainfall, our, our, our next speaker this afternoon is Mike Hoffman. Uh, he uh, doesn't need much of an in- introduction. Mike has uh, been a uh, friend of agriculture for many years. Mike is the chief meteorologist at WNDU in Notre Dame and has uh, worked in that industry over the course of the last 20 plus years. Um, While uh, Mike is a uh, Midwestern native, uh, Mike also has a uh, broad broad knowledge of weather patterns, trends, and developments across the country. And with that has uh, provided uh, Farm Journal and, and Ag Day TV with uh, weather forecasting uh, for a number of years and uh, serves as their meteorologist as well. So to give us a little bit of an update on where weather has brought us and where weather might be going, uh, we are bringing to the stage now Mike Hoffman. There's Mike. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I haven't shaken hands in a year. <laughs> it's nice to come in and actually do that. That's right. Um, did I see any of you coming out of the bar last night across from uh, the Holiday Inn Express? Maybe at about 10 30, 10 45? <laughs> no. No? Okay. <laughs> my, <laughs> no, my, my wife and I, first of all, we had this as the address, and we pull in. It's like, well, this isn't the Holiday Inn Express. So <laughs> this is like 10 45 last night. We came from northern Indiana. And so we drive downtown, we found the uh, Holiday Inn Express. And as we're turning the corner there, there's a bunch of people coming out of the bar. And just wondering, I said, that's probably some of the guys I'm going to talk to. (laughs) We'll see. Like Mike said, I'm actually, my main job is uh, I'm the chief meteorologist for uh, WNDU TV in South Bend. And uh, about 20 years ago, my uh, general manager came to me and said, uh, would you like to do weather for Ag Day and U.S. Farm Report? And I said, sure. You know, I grew up, uh, both my uh, grandparents were farmers. One was a part-time farmer, part-time preacher. Uh, The other was a full-time farmer. And uh, as is the case in many families, most of us are not in farming anymore, but uh, we're all in the farming communities. And uh, I grew up around the farm and have always loved it. And so I thought, yeah, that would be fantastic. And it's my favorite thing to do in the day anymore uh, because I'm getting tired of Facebook and Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it, gets, it gets really old when you're a local uh, local meteorologist, uh, all, the, all the different things that come on Twitter or get asked of you. And so uh, I, ju- I just love going on and uh, recording the Ag Day and U.S. Farm Report uh, shows. But uh, that's, that's one of the fun parts about my job. So I grew up in uh, the state of Indiana. I ended up going to Purdue University to get my degree in atmospheric sciences. Uh, I didn't go to school for television. I hated speech class, actually, to put it bluntly, and I never thought I would be doing it on television, but uh, that's where I ended up, and uh, and I've loved it uh, over the years. So uh, my first job was actually at AccuWeather out in Pennsylvania. AccuWeather is one of the biggest forecasting firms in the whole world, and so I went out there in 1981 uh, to work there and uh, learned a lot about forecasting the weather because you know you can learn all this stuff in the classroom and it just doesn't necessarily work out in the real world and that's true of a lot of different things including the weather and so that's one of those uh things that that helped me along with AccuWeather and then I decided to try television uh, in 1984 and uh came back to northern Indiana I've worked in Saginaw Michigan uh South Bend and Indianapolis uh doing television weather. But about 20 years ago, started on the Ag Day and U.S. Farm Report. So anyway, uh, one of the things I'm going to start off with here is uh, the term meteorologist and what a meteorologist means in the dictionary. And the dictionary says a person who studies the weather and forecasts the weather for uh, certain uh, parts of the country, certain parts of the world. Uh, But what a lot of people sometimes think of a meteorologist is Wouldn't I like to have a job like that where I can be wrong most of the time and still get paid for it, right? I mean, come on. Uh, So uh, we are dealing with with chaos, uh, which uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, get to here in a second. But uh, chaos uh, is 
is something that makes it impossible to actually forecast the weather perfectly. So here I am telling you how impossible it is, and then at the end of my talk here, I'm going to give you my latest forecast. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, we can try to get as close as possible. We can look at trends. We can look at uh, the, the situation in the oceans. Uh, those are all things that we have to look at to try to uh, <clears throat> try and come up with a forecast. And that's, uh, that's what we have to uh, do on a regular basis. And obviously, even with the biggest computer models now, uh, just a gazillion pieces of information all going into supercomputers now, they still can't forecast chaos because chaos is kind of unforecastable when you think about it because it's basically an infinite number of air particles all going around the world, all with different uh, temperatures, different speeds, and we're trying to forecast that. And so there are times where even going on the air on my local TV station, I say, it's going to be a dry night and we have one thunderstorm pop up over one corner of the viewing area. Within three hours, we're already a little wrong in places. And, uh, and so that is part of, uh, part of trying to forecast the weather and uh, part of the, the fun of it and the frustrating part of it uh, that we have when, uh, we're, when we're trying to do that. So, um, so those, are, those are things that uh, we deal with. We also uh, have to, well, one of the things that I've had to kind of learn about it is I'm not a person who likes being a celebrity. There are people in this business who, uh, and I've seen them, um, after the show is over, they'll go back and watch the, watch the, themselves on the TV, uh, you know, watch, watch themselves on the tape, and they enjoy that. I don't enjoy that. I don't like watching myself on TV. I don't like listening to myself, but I enjoy doing it. I just don't go back and look at it again later. So uh, a lot of times uh, folks like that um, enjoy all of the being a celebrity. Something that I enjoy, but it's something that I have to uh, have learned to do over the years. And that is when I walk out my front door, I have to be in a good mood. Just think about that for a second, because I never know who I'm going to meet that day that knows me from television. And uh, I, you never know who is uh, actually going to, uh, to meet you that day. And so you have to kind of be in a good mood. You can't see them in the mall and say, ah, I don't have time for this. I got that. I got to talk. You know, uh, I mean, then they go back and tell 10 of their friends that Mike Hoffman's a jerk. You know, I met him in the mall today and he didn't want to talk. So those are those are all things that uh, that happen when you're on TV. <clears throat> you end up uh, having to be a local celebrity, and in the case of Ag Day and U.S. Farm Report, a little bit of a national celebrity. It's not like being on one of the networks, but uh, still, we have about a quarter of a million people watching most of our shows, and uh, that's that's a fair amount of people. Any way you cut it. My local shows, we have more like uh, about 70,000 people watching. So I have more people watching me on Ag Day than I do on my local local newscasts. Uh, but they are spread out a lot more across the country rather than in just a, a small part of the uh, of the world in northern Indiana, <laughs> southwestern Michigan. So there you go. Meteorologists, only, uh, only job where you can be wrong regularly and still get paid for it. There probably are some other jobs out there, but uh, uh, this is one of them anyway. All right, <clears throat> so when you, when you think about the weather, everybody looks at it differently. Uh, it can be beautiful some days. Um, it can be fantastic, while at the same time, it can be nice and blue sky, but if, if you're a farmer or a gardener and you're wanting rain, that's not beautiful anymore. So it's to each his own in these uh, situations. Weather can be ugly, obviously. It can be serene, it can be dangerous during tornadoes, severe thunderstorms. It might not make sense sometimes, even to meteorologists. I remember uh, seeing a video one time, uh, this was years ago, some guy in Texas took a video and he goes, there's a tornado, there's a tornado. There, there were six tornadoes around him. And I, I thought as a meteorologist, that's not possible, but I just saw it and it happened. And so he was actually, he didn't realize it. He was in the middle of the circulation, but there were a bunch of little tornadoes all around him instead of one big one where he was. So he was kind of lucky, I suppose, uh, to be where he was. So sometimes it just doesn't make sense. Something happens and we're even surprised by it. It's uh, pretty much unpredictable. 
and downright crazy at times. So I do have some uh, kind of cool things to show you. This is a snow tornado. Again, something that you wouldn't think would happen because usually you need a lot of heat to get a tornado out of it. But there's snow on the ground and there's a tornado. It'd probably be a little more like a water spout type of a thing. It wouldn't be real strong, but nonetheless, uh, just the fact that it's there. I would never want to see this coming at me, and I never have, thank goodness. Uh, and that is a sandstorm, and that is like a cold front sandstorm coming right at uh, everybody and uh, basically, man, I'd be getting inside, closing all the windows and uh, hoping for the best in that case. Uh, this might look like a tornado to some people, but it's actually a downburst of uh, rain. And so this is the case where you get rain on one side of the street, sunshine on the other. And these are the, these are the things that happen all the time. This is called a roll cloud, and typically it's pretty close to mountains, uh, sometimes near the shore. Um, and uh, you'll actually get a rolling motion uh, as air comes up over the mountains and it kind of rolls and you'll end up sometimes getting clouds like that <clears throat> in different parts of the world. This is an extreme example of an anvil. Every thunderstorm has an anvil, uh, which is this top part right up here. Basically, it's where all that heat's rising. It hits a part of the atmosphere where it's warmer up above it. So hot air doesn't rise anymore and it has to spread out. There can be times where there can be thunderstorms over western Iowa, eastern Nebraska, and we can begin to see the eastern edge of that anvil here. Uh, it, it can go out 500, 600, 700 miles sometimes. Um, and I'm not sure, did I miss, there we go. And so this, in this particular case, it was out over the water, and this was just one little updraft there, and you can see how it spread out just perfectly. Now this is a huge thunderstorm coming in. Uh, obviously, sometimes you get these these big pieces blowing out ahead of it as the uh, thunderstorm bows outward, and many times a thunderstorm like that's going to have some strong winds with it. And sometimes you might think this might be part of a tornado, and I'd have to see video to be 100%, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be a, a, a downburst of winds that are probably 40, 50, 60 miles per hour coming out of that thunderstorm and it's picking up some dirt. And sometimes you'll get little spin ups out of that. So uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, seen that. This is one of the most awesome pictures of a tornado ever taken because they caught lightning with it as well, uh, which you wouldn't have seen that tornado at night without the lightning. Uh, and so uh, that, that would have been a kind of a dangerous situation. This looks like a tornado, it's kind of not. This is where lava is flowing into the Pacific Ocean in Hawaii. And because of all the heat being created out here, it has this rising motion and it began to spin. And so that tornado is not going to move anywhere. But it's really cool to think that uh, it's just forming right offshore because of hot lava uh, flowing into the ocean. All right. Uh, sometimes we get to what we call a rope tornado. A lot of times this is when the tornado is kind of weakening. Uh, the main part of it's still rotating, but the part on the ground is kind of dragging its heels, and you end up with this long rope of a tornado like that. This is a water spout that looks kind of similar. <laughs> when you look at the flow up there, uh, really kind of cool right along the uh, shoreline. And this is what we would call a land spout, I think. Uh, there's probably a thunderstorm off to the side there, but this uh, is kind of like a rope tornado. Uh, picking up a whole bunch of red dirt, and there you go, getting something like that. And there are obviously a couple of dust devils, <clears throat> which I'm sure most of you have seen that from time to time. Uh, those are pretty impressive, though, pretty tall, and that one actually looks like a little double one, maybe two kind of spinning around each other. Well, this is uh, probably one of the most uh, famous pictures ever taken of a twin tornado, and this was taken in Elkhart, Indiana, actually about 20 miles from where I live, and the Elkhart uh, reporter, the newspaper reporter, caught this picture. This is US 33. Looks like it's going between the tornadoes. Well, what was actually happening is all the uh, people who saw this tornado said this tornado was splitting, and then it was coming back together, and then it was splitting and coming back together. But what was happening is they were going around each other. And so at some times, there was one in front of the other one, so it looked like they were one, and then two, and then one. And so this obviously just caused massive destructions. This was Palm Sunday, 1965. And uh, that's probably part of the reason I got really interested in the weather, in all honesty. I didn't see that, 
but I saw some of the uh, damage created from them. All right, so weather forecasting. Uh, we've had major changes over the past 40 years. <laughs> Technology has made tremendous strides. Accuracy, not so much. <laughs> we've improved, but not as much as you would have thought with supercomputers. And, and again, that kind of goes back to chaos, which I'm going to get here. So there's me in 1981 at uh, AccuWeather, one of the uh, first computers, first one I ever saw anyway. And here's how we got a radar. At AccuWeather, you forecast for a certain part of the country. So if I came in one day, I might be forecasting for Michigan and Wisconsin, let's say. And so we would have several TV radio stations <laughs> up there. And to get a radar then, you would tell a technician, I need a radar from Madison. And they would go to this uh, little, almost like a teletype machine and uh, put in the telephone number for the radar from Madison. And out in about two minutes would come a wet sheet of paper where the image of the radar is burned into it. And they would rip it off and bring it back to you. So you have about, uh, yeah, maybe a six by six piece of wet paper handed to you that is the radar from Madison. And you didn't see any colors. There's no greens, yellows, and reds like you see on TV now. You just saw black and white. And uh, the reason it was wet paper is because it was burning it into the paper and it would keep it from catching on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Who came up with that idea? I don't know. But, uh, but that was the best we could do. And so we're forecasting for different parts of the country. Back in the 90s then, uh, we, we still camp with, a, with several other families. And uh, my wife and I have a pop-up camper now. And we would go camping and it would start to get dark off in the western sky. And everybody would look at me and say, so what's going to happen? And I just kind of like, well, what, do I have my pocket Doppler with me? You know, and we made fun of pocket Doppler. Now we have it. Yeah. I had no idea that was going to happen. And now everybody can be a weather expert. Uh, so my wife and I were sitting in a restaurant a couple before the pandemic. So I guess it was a couple of years ago now. Um, and so I, we hear these two girls behind us looking at their phone saying, hey, it's supposed to start raining at 3 a.m. And I just rolled my eyes because it's like, well, why do they think they know when it's going to start raining? Because their app said it's going to start raining at 3 a.m. And it's not going to probably, okay? Because the apps are just using one computer model and that computer model will change every six hours on what, on what you're seeing. Yes, it's the best information you have at that point, but you can't count on it. Uh, and uh, I, th I think a lot of the younger people now <laughs> Uh, just count on uh, their weather on their phone. I don't know where technology is going from here um, because uh, nothing that we have now I would have seen 40 years ago when I was sitting here in AccuWeather in 1981. So the average studio now in 2021, we have several computers, some of them giving us weather information, <clears throat> and two or three of them are actually producing graphics. I produce some graphics. Uh, I have to draw some of them myself, come up with a forecast, and then draw them. And uh, that's one of the, uh, the things that we do. But I think society has changed a little bit as well. This is a picture from the blizzard, blizzard of 1978. I'm not sure what this part of the country got out of that, but I know northern Indiana uh, and Purdue shut down for the first time ever uh, in 1978 when I was there. But that was the look of county roads in places. And uh, they were using uh, front-end loaders to get uh, U.S. highways open uh, to get the, uh, the, the snow off of it. So in society, uh, 1978, going to school, 2018, no school. Just no, no snow. Yeah, we got to cancel school. Sometimes I come into work and they'll say, hey, they canceled a bunch of school today. And I, I why? <laughs> I don't know. But I get it. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> so how we get the forecast. In 1981, we had three TV stations to tune into at 6 and 11 o'clock. That's really all we had. The Weather Channel was just starting, and so uh, the Weather Channel uh, ha has changed that a little bit, but they were just a minor part of it because nowadays you get it from TV, from the Internet, from Facebook, from Twitter, from apps on your phones, and young people are not watching local news. I don't know what local news is going to be like in 20 years if it's even still on TV on a regular basis. They might be producing podcasts or something where they 
they give you five minutes of the new local news of the day and two minutes of weather and you can watch it separately you can pick and choose what you want rather than having to sit through 30 minutes of uh of the weather so i don't know where that's going <laughs> um but but we'll see uh because uh, things are definitely changing when you look at the the ratings on tv shows uh the younger demographics, the 20, 20 something year olds, not really watching local news very much. So weather information that we use, we obviously use radar. We have radar all across the country, uh, satellite pictures. We get great satellite pictures anymore. Um, weather stations, the official ones at the airports, and then uh, Coco Raz uh, is, a, is just a national organization of people who are collecting rain, especially rain amounts, but sometimes snow amounts. Uh, which really help us a lot. And obviously the computer models that we look at every single day. And we have multiple models to look at anymore. Um, there, there are times where I, when I'm doing my local um, forecast, we have to do a 10 day forecast now, <sighs> which when my news director said, uh, said uh, I'd like you to do a 10 day forecast instead of a seven day now. And, uh, okay. <laughs> Why is that when we don't really get the seventh day right very often? But that's just beside the point. We want 10 days. Okay, we'll, we'll do 10 days for you. But sometimes when I'm doing that forecast, the two main models that I look at is the GFS model, which is the main US long range model, and the European model. There are times where on that 10th day out, they are literally 35 degrees difference. One might be showing 70 for the high, and the other might be showing 35 for the high. And what are you supposed to do with that? <laughs> I mean, you just average it, which is what I tend to do, is I usually go pretty close to normal at that point. Other times they're pretty close, and you have a little more confidence, uh, but sometimes they're just uh, way, way off. So what we're looking at as, <clears throat> as a whole in the Northern Hemisphere, we have a circulation in the Northern Hemisphere and one in the Southern Hemisphere, and they're pretty much separate. Um, and so we have a jet stream, which is basically flowing around the entire world. So when you look at it from our perspective, it's flowing mainly from west to east, but sometimes it does rotate. Sometimes it does get caught and not flowing very well from west to east. When you look at it from up above, it goes all the way around the globe. So it goes across the Atlantic, Europe, Asia, Pacific and back to us again. And so if there's big waves over us, there's going to be big waves in other parts of the world as well. So when you think about it, when you think about any little lake, if you have big waves in parts of it, you're gonna have big waves in others because they're all affecting each other. And that flow kind of goes around the world and causes chaos. Uh, literally, like I said, infinite number of air particles all going around the world, different uh, temperatures, different speed. And the chaos theory, um, this is a long time ago this guy came up with this, details of a hurricane being influenced by minor perturbations, they have to use big words whenever they do something like this, just minor perturbations such as the flapping of the wings of a distant butterfly several weeks earlier. Now, when you think about that, that's a little bit far-fetched, but every little thing in the atmosphere going on affects other things perhaps downstream, and it could be later. Now what he's saying there is some butterfly flapping its wings in China uh, helped to cause a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico weeks later. I see, I, I think he went a little overboard there, but nonetheless, it's kind of something that is true. Little things can happen, little things can be happening out there that the computer models don't pick up on and they end up uh, being wrong because of that, because of chaos. So we have problems. <clears throat> Things can happen between the times that we collect the data. So when the computer model is taking uh, 7 a.m. data, uh, 7 a.m. Eastern time, 6 a.m. Uh, Central time, and putting it all into the big supercomputer, coming up with a forecast, things can be happening before or after that that aren't even picked up with the computer. Things can happen between stations that are reporting that information. And so between Madison and Green Bay, a huge thunderstorm pops up, but that's not even shown up in their data at all. They don't get any rain. They don't have any change in the temperature. And simplifying equations. I remember a professor of mine at Purdue wrote this big, long equation on the blackboard, a little equal sign in the middle of it. <sighs> and we're dutifully writing all of it down 
I'm not understanding part of it already because like, okay, I don't know how that uh, comes into it. And he says, here's what we have to do to get the computer to handle it. Because if we put this, this equation into our current computers, it's gonna put out a forecast for tomorrow in about 24 hours. Well, the weather's already here, so it's pretty worthless. So what you have to do is you have to simplify the equation. So you have to start Xing out the things that aren't important and you come up with an equation where the forecast can be done in about two or three hours from the computer or tomorrow. And, uh, and you, you really cause problems when you take out little parts of the equation like that. But then again, even the supercomputers now have to have it simplified a little bit, just not as much as we used to have to have that happen. So the future of weather, <clears throat> technology will continue to get better. Supercomputers will continue to get faster. They'll be able to take more information, spit out the information, spit out the forecast more quickly. Uh, so the computers will continue to get faster. So I think we slowly get better forecasts. I know they've improved over the years, but as a meteorologist, it's still frustrating to me sometimes to put out a forecast that looks really, really good, and then it just doesn't turn out at all the next day. Ends up like, where's the sun? Clouds are here all day, which means you're going to be off by 20 degrees in the summer. Uh, and so it, it's frustrating, but at the same time, I think we will continue to get slowly better, especially in the longer range. Um, I think we're seeing things where we can look at ocean water temperatures and we have enough data now back uh, decades and decades where we can come up with a little bit better forecasts. At least we've improved it somewhat. Uh, and we'll probably continue to do that. But I don't think we'll ever be perfect. I have a couple of uh, uh, young granddaughters, and I don't even think when they're 90 years old, the forecast on TV will be perfect yet. It's just not going to happen. We're talking chaos, and that's going to be hard to do. So weather on TV, I have to create graphics every day. Some of them are created for me. Some of them I have to do. I use maps, obviously. Uh, sensationalism. I put that on there because one of the things I try not to do is sensationalize things. And people on TV love to do it. They love to do it in the news. They love to do it in the weather. Whatever it is, they love to uh, make it sound as bad or as exciting as possible. Uh, when sometimes you just have to tell it like it is. And I think people appreciate that. When we get done with the uh, tornado warnings, uh, in South Bend, I usually get a lot of people saying, thank you for just telling me what's going on and not making me scared to death about it. Uh, obviously, if a tornado is bearing down on your house, you need to be scared of it. But <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, we if you stay calm on TV and just tell it like it is, I think people appreciate that. more. Uh, we don't have a lot of privacy in this job. I talked a little bit about that uh, before the graphics came up here. Uh, we have to be in a good mood whenever we walk out our front door. <clears throat> so when, I, uh, when I'm when uh, i creating, let's say, Ag Day graphics, I'm using uh, information uh, from the computer for tomorrow morning. We record this in the evening, the evening before, because it's sent out to uh, hundreds of TV stations and uh, other cable systems across the country. And so we do have to record it the evening before. So we put in uh, what we think is uh, showing up on the weather map. So you have a lot of isobars here. It looks kind of confusing, but I know that's a low pressure system, high pressure system. And so then I put those on the weather map and I'll move it 12 hours, move all the fronts along. And you end up with a map that looks like that without the isobars. And then it's in animation. So we can show you the next uh, 48 hours or so of what it looks like the weather is going to do from the computer models. And so every day I have to do that. I have to put all that together and I come up with the graphics uh, to put on TV. Uh, weather on TV, um, you know, I've had a lot of cool personal experiences over the years. Um, one of the things I get the most when I'm out in public is I didn't know you were so tall. Um, I don't know if I look short on TV or what, but I do know that TV usually adds about 20 pounds to you. Uh, and so I think that just kind of changes your, the perspective of what people are expecting when they see you out in person. And so that's probably the, the biggest comment that I get most of the time. I actually did one time picking up milk on my way home. My wife had asked me to do that. And uh, being the, the uh, dutiful husband, I decided to 
yeah, I'd better stop and get the milk for tomorrow. And so I stopped at the, uh, the grocery store, and the woman in front of me kind of did the double take. Oh, I didn't think about you eating. She actually said that to me. Now, I'm sure she was embarrassed by it later, but that's what came to her first. Uh, she didn't look at me on TV as a person, and a lot of people don't. We're just somebody on there. I don't, I don't know. It, it's interesting, but, uh, but we, we get things like that a lot. <clears throat> Daytona Beach. <laughs> um, we were there, were there when my kids were younger. And uh, just sitting there, and uh, my daughter and uh, wife went on down the beach looking for seashells. My son and I are sitting there watching these kids play with a boogie board. I don't know what it was, just a piece of wood, slides along the water, out on the, uh, the beach, and these kids were playing with it. So I said, hey, let's go up and watch them. And so I, uh, I went up uh, with my son, and they all turned around, and they all looked at me. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, uh, here I am in my swimsuit. This is a youth group from Wakarusa, Indiana. And they were down there on spring break at the same time I was. And uh, they're all taking pictures. And I said, just don't, don't send any of those to the TV station. Thank goodness. Thank goodness this was before Facebook and Twitter, though. <laughs> so that, that would have changed things totally. And I had a guy following me through the mall one day. And uh, I could tell he wanted to talk, but he couldn't get his nerve up. And he finally came up and told me that he had a dog that could forecast the weather better than I could. <laughs> and, All right, tell me a little bit about the dog. Ended up the dog had been dead for about four or five years, but uh, so it must have been before he died that he was being a really good forecasting dog. So we get all sorts of things like that uh, when you're on TV. People uh, like like to uh, say things. 99.9% .9 of it, though, people are very nice. I don't get too much in the way of uh, negative stuff. Um, we have a Facebook page for uh, TV meteorologists all across the country now, and there's so many complaints on there all the time about people. Uh, and so many people complaining about them. And it's like I, I don't get that very much, so I'm happy about that. Uh, I don't know why that is, but m the majority of people are very nice to me. Ag audience is the most knowledgeable, which is why I like to talk <laughs> to the agricultural audience. You understand weather. Weather means something to you. It's not just something that you have to deal with the next day. It affects your bottom line, and that's why it's so important. Uh, I've had some awesome experiences. I went on two tornado chase trips with uh, Valparaiso University. They actually have a class where you get one credit for taking a 10-day trip on a tornado chase. And so as a TV station, we went with them uh, two different times. We took the satellite truck. This was back at, one was in the late 90s, another one in the mid 2000s. Um, never saw a tornado either trip, but came back both times with a dented up news car from Hale. Uh, so, it was still a fun trip, one of the most fun things I've ever done. But probably the coolest thing because of TV that I've ever been able to do is I was able to ride on the Vomit Comet, a NASA zero gravity plane. That goes out over the Gulf of Mexico and does these big parabolas like this. And so if the pilot does it right, when he comes up here, he follows the trajectory of what a baseball might be doing at that speed. And so if he does it right, you have zero gravity inside the plane. You're falling at the same rate that the ball would be, and so you end up with zero gravity. Uh, the problem with that is at the bottom you get double gravity. And that's really hard on you. Uh, they told us before, they said uh, that that's why it's called the Vomit Comet. For obvious reasons some people can't quite handle that and I'll tell you what I wouldn't have been able to if I hadn't figured out one thing and that was you don't sit there during double gravity you lay on the floor okay it's a lot easier on your body <laughs> so so then I enjoyed it so then when you're starting to come back out of it you start floating up off the floor again now why were we doing that NASA does experiments and there was a kid that went to a, a, a high school very close to South Bend and then was at Purdue. And his experiment got chosen uh, for rocket fuel and how it is handled in zero gravity. And he had a system like a balloon inside the, uh, the, uh, the gas tank <clears throat> would so come together and keep it all together. Because the problem with gas in zero gravity is it's 
all over the place. It floats everywhere. So you have to keep it all together. And so because of that, uh, they were able to take a TV station with them and they asked me if I would do it. And yeah, that, that's, that's one of those cool things to be able to do. So that was uh, one of those, uh, those things that uh, I've been able to do that's uh, really cool. All right, climate change. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I stay away from the subject on TV. A lot of meteorologists do not. They take a stand on it and they make about half the people unhappy with it. It's way too political. You're not allowed to have any other opinion. You're only allowed to have one opinion. And uh, I don't like that. There's, there's always different opinions in science. Sorry, but uh, science is never 100% sure of anything when you're talking about the future of chaos. Mm -hmm. You just can't be. So uh, this is where, when I grew up, some of you, <laughs> whoops, some of you probably did too. Let me go back here. Hopefully it'll stay. <laughs> well, you saw them there. Those were two articles. Those were two articles talking about the coming ice age in the mid-70s. Uh, we were having really cold winters at times, so it was very easy to convince the public, hey, we're going to have uh, really cold weather coming up, and so uh, we might be heading into another ice age. By the drought of 88, we were going back the other way. Now all of a sudden it was global warming. Um, and then eventually they changed it to climate change so that they could blame everything on the change in climate, uh, which is a little bit far-fetched, but I'm going to get to that. Uh, the Day After Tomorrow is a uh, movie, and uh, has anybody seen that? Yeah. Day After Tomorrow? Yeah, it's a cool movie, uh, it, and it's based on a real theory. Basically, it's um, all of a sudden there's this massive polar vortex up over the North Pole, <clears throat> and it's expanding uh, <laughs> southward as all of a sudden the, the ice starts in Europe, and then the really cold stuff comes to Canada and North America, and before long, uh, people are being driven south, and Mexico is closing their border with the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because all, oh, we're all going to the warmer weather, I guess, to try to survive, and it's all of a sudden climate change caused a, a, an ice age, an immediate ice age. It's actually based on a real theory, um, but it wouldn't happen nearly as quickly because it was Hollywoodized. It was created by Hollywood and therefore made a lot worse than it would be in real life. But the jets or the Gulf Stream is a river of water, warm water flowing up around Florida out of the Gulf of Mexico, goes all the way up into the North Atlantic. So it actually makes Europe warmer than we are on an average year because of all of that. So let's say, the theory goes, if we do start melting the polar ice caps and we do start flooding the North Atlantic with fresh, cold water, that shuts down the Gulf Stream. And all of a sudden, the Earth goes back the other way, automatically. So could the Gulf Stream be a thermostat for the world? Uh, and so, what? Maybe mankind is creating a whole bunch of heat. Maybe that's going to cause issues. We're going to melt some of the polar ice cap. Maybe the Gulf Stream would send us back the other way. I will say this. Um, more people are going to die in cold than extreme heat um, worldwide uh, because you're not going to have any crops uh, if, if you end up with uh, really cold uh, weather coming into the, the middle of this country, let's say. Uh, but so climate change issues. What are the actual temperatures <clears throat> right now? Uh, we're measuring them. We measure them from satellite, and we measure them on the ground in all the different places. Historic temperatures, what are those? Um, they've actually adjusted the warm temperatures from the 40s and 50s. I'm not an expert in it. They claim it's for a reason. They claim <laughs> the thermos thermometers weren't as accurate then. Well, that could be true, but why did you move them all in the same direction? I'll, I'll show you a graph on that. Long-term cycles. There's a lot of long-term cycles going on. Um, how much of those are affecting us and solar cycles? So let's get to some of those. I know some of these are a little bit, a little bit weird, but when uh, Arthur Hansen put out his first prediction, um, he predicted the worst case scenario up here for actual temperatures worldwide is middle case scenario right there. 
And his best case scenario right here, um, which he predicted if CO2 emissions are reduced back to 2000 levels, which they have not been, not even close, we would be here. So he's already wrong on his temperatures. Yes, we have gone up. So how much of that is man-made? I can't prove it for sure, one way or the other. Uh, we are gonna have to deal with it at some point if it keeps going in this direction. This is the um, uh, satellite temperature, which in my opinion is a little more accurate because we're not, we're not using individual stations that have changed over the years which I'm gonna to get to in a second here, but this is just taken from the satellite. And there is definitely from 1979, that's as far back as we can go, because we didn't have satellites taking the temperatures back before that. And so the average has definitely gone up about uh, a little more than a third of a degree uh, Celsius, which would be about a degree Fahrenheit. So it has gone up <laughs> some and something that we do have to watch. <clears throat> On this one, um, here is the actual data for the whole U.S. for temperatures. This goes back to 1900. So the actual data shows a warm spell there in the 30s and 40s. We had the drought years. We had dust bowl years. Then we cooled down through the 70s into the early 80s, and we've gone back up again. Here is what two separate people, Berkeley and uh, an another group, adjusted those temperatures to. So <laughs> you can claim that they're doing it for political reasons. I don't know that they are. They might be great scientists on that, but why did, why did everything get adjusted in the same direction to make it look like the warmth in the 30s and 40s that wasn't as uh, warm as it was? I don't know. But when I look at uh, my local um, stations, uh, it doesn't show that, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second as well. The other interesting thing is, this was a study from, uh, from NASA, the rural uh, airports that are still surrounded by farmland, this has been their temperature trend. This takes us through about 2010, yeah. Um, and so you can see that's still cooler than what it was back in the 1930s and 40s. The urban airports go like that. Why is that? Well, let's take O'Hare. O'Hare used to be out in the middle of cornfields. It's cooler at night in the middle of a cornfield than it is surrounded by pavement. So you end up with an artificial warming around that airport because you've put all this concrete and city around it. And so how much of our warming is due to that right there? Uh, the difference in uh, the, the cities versus the urban areas <laughs> These airports have not changed their location. These have not changed their location either, but their location changed around them. And so it, uh, it makes things look a little bit different. <clears throat> so we did have a very warm period. This goes way, way back, obviously. Uh, back to uh, 7, 800, 900. Vikings arriving in Greenland. Look how warm it was back in that period. Now, we're getting back up. Not quite that warm yet but we're getting back up into that area. We have the Little Ice Age right there, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, even the early 1800s, we had some uh, pretty, pretty cold temperatures as well. So I decided to look back at my local station to see the top 30 warmest years and what decades they fell in. So you can see the 1930s are the most, and we have gone up, we had this cool spells, 50s, 60s, and 70s, we have gone up uh, somewhat, once again, into that same neighborhood. But again, these, this is with unadjusted data. So the scientists have only adjusted the averages across the country. They can't go back and change individual records <laughs> for one airport. And so when you look at that, uh, you can see that we're getting back up into that warm area again, but not extremely so. Now, this was uh, a little bit different to me. Uh, this was the top 30 wettest years. I think one of the things that we're seeing is that when you warm the earth up, you evaporate more water out of all the bodies of water everywhere, and you can end up with more and larger rain events. Uh, and we, we have started to see that, I think, 
uh, over the past couple of decades. And so you can see some of the wettest years we've had besides the 1970s there uh, have, have started to come recently, much drier back in the, the early, early days of uh, record keeping in South Bend. So that was just for one station, but I think in the Midwest we would see similar, uh, similar things to that. So solar cycles or sunspots. I know this, this is kind of counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense. More sunspots means the sun is putting out extra energy. I would have thought before I, before I started studying this a little bit that a black spot on the sun would mean no energy is coming out of there because it's like blocked. But that's not the case. There's actually more energy coming out of those spots than there is out of the rest of the sun. So the sun, more sunspots means you're actually increasing slightly the amount of <laughs> solar energy reaching the earth. <clears throat> so warmer temperatures are the result, although it usually takes, it might take decades to actually see uh, that change in the earth's temperature. So when you go back to the number of uh, sunspot years, uh, you can see there is this time where there's almost nothing. This is called, you can look this up on Google if you want to, Maunder Minimum. And this was the mini ice age uh, back then. It came then and shortly thereafter, because again, there's kind of a delayed response in that. We had another minimum of sunspots right there in the early 1800s. I was kind of cold. Went down a little bit more here, which is the coldest period for most stations here in the Midwest. Uh, when you look at records, and then we went way up uh, during 1950s and 60s. So the question becomes how much of the warming uh, that we've seen recently is due to this uh, in a delayed response. So you move it a couple of decades. We've been going down each time for the past uh, 20 to 30 years on the, on the solar cycle. So there you go back to 1980. How many sunspots there were? They go through about a 14-year cycle there, up and down, up and down, and you can see uh, the current one is projected to be slightly lower again. And so the sun is actually putting out a little less energy than it was back in the 80s and 90s. Now maybe mankind is putting out enough CO2 that we would have been warmer than we even are right now. And so that's something that uh, is interesting as well. Maybe the solar cycles are helping us, keeping the, the heating to a minimum. <laughs> My point in all of this is just uh, showing you there's still a lot of question marks. You're only hearing one side of it on the news media. They aren't allowed. Um, I, I follow some people who are definitely skeptics or uh, deniers of man-made global warming, uh, at least to the point where it's going to cause a major catastrophes, and um, they aren't ever heard because the news media won't put them on. Uh, I, in science, in science, you have to put both sides on. Just look at the pandemic. Um, Fauci, who is now the god of, uh, of uh, scientists for the pandemic, originally said masks don't work. He originally said there's no evidence that transmits human to human. So science is always changing. I'm not blaming him for that, but that's what was said early on, and now they've all changed their minds. Now they tell us we can touch anything we want, we're not going to get coronavirus, and we've been wiping down our new set every single day, twice a day. So uh, things change in science, and I think you need to hear all sides of it, and we aren't always doing that. So the next solar cycle, how big is that going to be? That's going to be kind of a question and that could uh, cause changes in, uh, in the climate as we head forward. So everything seems to be blamed on climate change. Some things can be, other things cannot. Um, I'm going to show you some uh, statistics showing that definitely not increasing violent tornadoes in the U.S. It is definitely not increasing Category 3 hurricanes in the U.S., Category 3, 4, or 5. It is probably increasing heat waves and flooding events. We've seen some pretty massive flooding events over the past couple of uh, decades. So here are the, violent, the number of violent tornadoes per year uh, going back to 1950 when they first started really keeping records. Uh, so the 70s were pretty big. The super outbreak of 1974 was massive. But look at the trend since then, besides one year there, about uh, 2012, uh, and it's gone down since 
since then. In fact, I think I have a graphic to show the next. Yeah, 2018, we actually had no EF5 tornadoes in the entire U.S. for the first time ever. Um, and so you can see the trend there. There's no question we're getting fewer violent tornadoes. I don't know the reason for that, but we are. And so when they talk about an EF4 or 5 hitting and climate change causing it, that's just not true. Um, we are seeing a report of more tornadoes each year than we used to, a bunch of small tornadoes, not these violent ones. But how much of that is because of uh, everybody having a camera phone <laughs> and uh, recording it and more people living in the country to see them? Uh, back in the, uh, you know, the 1950s and 60s, you could have had a tornado out in the middle of a field. Farmer might have seen it, might have reported it, might have not. And so you, you end up, I think, getting more reports of all these small tornadoes. But when you look at the violent ones, they are not becoming stronger than they used to on average. And uh, tornado deaths by decade going down. Now, part of that is because of the warning systems that we have and because of our phones and weather radios giving people warning. So part of that is due to that. And so that's, that's a great thing that's uh, been going on. <clears throat> Number of U.S. landfalling major hurricanes, category three, four, or five by decade. Definitely, again, a downward trend. Now, when you see a year like last year, uh, the Hurricane Center called it the, the biggest hurricane year ever. Number of tornadoes. Back in the 50s, <clears throat> 40s, 50s, and 60s, they did not ever count a hurricane out in the middle of the Atlantic. First of all, they didn't see it because we didn't have satellites. Secondly, um, even if they knew about it, they wouldn't have counted it because they wouldn't have necessarily known for sure how strong it is. Now we're Naming, tornado, naming hurricanes out in the middle of the Atlantic that have no chance of ever hitting land, but we're naming them anyway because they look like a tornado. Their structure is like a hurricane, sorry. Their structure is like a hurricane, and so they're naming them. So basically, the Hurricane Center, you can't compare the 50s, 1950s till now because they're naming a whole bunch more than, than they used to, which were, were never named, but were still there back in the 1950s. So to me, the only way to compare uh, large hurricanes is by number of landfalls in the US. Um, now, there could be other reasons for this. Um, maybe more of them are staying out over the Atlantic than there used to be, not coming quite as far west. But uh, when you look at that, the trend is definitely downward once again. Uh, now, we've had things like Hurricane Harvey that hit uh, Houston. It was not a massive tornado or a hurricane, I keep saying that. But it sat there for two or three days, just dumping copious amounts of water. And uh, so that's one of those situations where you're getting a whole bunch more rain out of it. But it wasn't a destructive hurricane except for the flooding. And flooding is awful uh, when, you, when you're when you in a major flood like that. Okay, so climate change issues. Of how The question is, how much of the warming is due to mankind? Yes, we are having some warming over the last four decades. How much of it is due to mankind? Are natural cycles helping or hurting? They could actually be helping us a little bit. Oops. I think there's a button back here that does the same thing, right? <laughs> That's what I keep hitting with my, uh, with my other finger. So uh, I'll try and keep it away from that. So, that's something that there's a lot of different natural cycles going on. Ocean water temperatures and uh, is just one of them. Nobody can be sure of of proving that one way or the other. So when the, when they say there's a consensus among scientists that uh, man-made uh, global warming could cause a catastrophe down the road, there, there is a high percentage of uh, scientists who believe that, but there's a decent amount that believe no, that that's probably not going to happen. And they cannot prove it because unlike a, a, a scientist likes to have a laboratory where they can do this with this, uh, they can change the parameters a little bit and test it and see what happens. Can't do that with the Earth. We have one Earth. We don't have a second Earth that we can test it to see, hey, let's put twice the amount of CO2 in the air and see what happens. Uh, so we can't do that. And so nobody can really prove it one way or the other. I'm, I think all of us would agree 
Um, it's important to be environmentally sound. It's important to use as little energy as possible and to try to conserve our land. But, uh, but as far as catastrophe from uh, global warming, from climate change, um, we're not sure. Uh, and nobody really can be. All right, let's get to the weather. You've probably been uh, sitting there bored part of the time waiting on the spring outlook. And I've already told you how impossible it is to forecast the weather, and now I'm going to try to do it for you anyway. <laughs> so, similar setup. What I like to do is look at similar setups from the past. And so one of the things I look at is the El Nino La Nina. We're in a weakening La Nina situation. Now, La Nina means less as you head into spring and summer than it does in the winter, but it still has an effect. Ocean water temperature pattern, especially the North Pacific, where our jet stream is coming from. Uh, and then uh, winter weather uh, similarities to previous years. And then obviously the computer model. So all of those I try to use to come up <clears throat> with a forecast. Root zone moisture um, has shown this for a while. The very wet area is down here. This is shrunk. It, it was wet for a while. Any of you guys still have wet fields? You know, the cool thing about this root zone moisture is it's, uh, it, it's taken from a satellite by NASA. And so it's not reporting anywhere from the actual Earth, but it is getting it from the satellite and they can measure uh, how it should look compared to how it does look. And so it, it changes much more quickly than previous products that uh, tried to show the topsoil moisture. Um, so I do like it, but I still think there are times where it's not, uh, not perfect in some areas. So even though it's showing these wet areas here, it, actually you can see there are pockets of dry also and they're in the parts of southern, southern and central Wisconsin. But uh, we're seeing the very dry conditions out here for some reason, North Dakota. This area is continued, um, and obviously we don't want that to continue to get worse. When you look at the drought monitor, the long range, long term dryness, uh, it's mainly in the southwest, four corner region back into California. That's been in an a area getting larger and larger over North Dakota and South Texas getting uh, drier and drier as well. So here's the, uh, the, the La Nina forecast, actually. <laughs> See all the different computer models? See the differences there? Now, we obviously try and average that out. So a minus five is considered a uh, La Nina, where the, it's slightly cooler along the, uh, the equator in the Pacific Ocean. Most forecasts are having to come up above that a little bit, so we're not really looking at anything. They kind of sometimes call that La Nada or nothing, uh, and that's probably what we're looking at going forward. So I'm using that in my forecast. This is from uh, NOAA, uh, their forecast. And just to explain this, uh, when you see these numbers on here, the, NOAA stopped actually putting out forecasts for above normal, normal and below normal. Um, they've started putting these percentages out. So what this 40% right here means, means there's a 40% chance along that line of it being warmer than normal. 60% chance of it being one of the other two, normal or below. Okay, so that's not a real high number. Now, when you start to get to 50, 60%, yeah, that's a pretty good bet. Uh, we're probably gonna be above normal. So what I'm saying is that EC right there means equal chances for all three. 33% above, 33 normal, 33 below. I don't like what they've done here. I get it from a scientific standpoint, but to the average person that does equal chances, what does that mean? That's the area that I would go near normal just because that's what you expect to happen when you're not sure it's gonna go one way or the other. As far as rainfall is concerned, they're going for an above normal Great Lakes, mid-Atlantic, um, above normal, Texas, into the west. All right, so my forecast, I, I split them up uh, the rest of April, and I just redid this two nights ago uh, because all of a sudden we're looking at all computer models showing a, a shot of colder air here for a, a couple-week period uh, later in April and early in May. It goes all the way down into the southeast. So I, I, kind of, I had a, a large area of above normal here, but I, I've changed that just recently. Uh, above normal still in the northeast, 
and out west. <clears throat> I do think overall, I agree with the with Noah that it's probably overall going to be a pretty warm season coming up. There's May temperatures. I'm going above normal western and central Great Lakes all the way through the southwest. I'm worried about much above normal there, which is definitely not good for an expanding drought. Um, and then going to June, I expand that uh, above normal even farther east, with really only the northwest and the east coast staying closer to normal, uh, with that above normal area also coming uh, farther north. 90 day outlook for precipitation. And this is always the hard part. <laughs> it's rainfall is one of those things that um, if you start, if you start missing thunderstorms, and you've probably seen this happen in your own fields, if you start missing things in a certain area of the country uh, and storms start missing you, it just perpetuates itself. So a drought begets drought. A drought means there's no moisture there to evaporate the next time warm air comes overhead. And so guess what? You don't get any thunderstorms developing to give you rain anymore. So uh, a drought just kind of sometimes expands and gets worse because of that. And so forecasting 90 days out for precipitation, there's no question that's a little bit of a crapshoot. I mean, you're just trying to trying to uh, get it the best you can. But most uh, situations we believe from the Northeast across the Great Lakes, probably above normal total precipitation during that period. Uh, below normal, unfortunately, in the major drought areas, uh, back there. Now, North Dakota would like to see this, although I will say this, it seems like every storm that's come along recently, it starts forming over Minnesota anymore because of all the dryness over North Dakota. So we don't want that North Dakota dry area to start expanding too much because uh, it will, <laughs> it can start to affect the Western Great Lakes at some point uh, if we just start shutting down all the production of uh, thunderstorms in that area. All right, here's the uh, outlook from uh, NOAA for the middle of uh, summer and on into September. So July, August, September, going above normal basically in the whole country. And uh, I can't uh, totally disagree with that. I'll show you that. They're going above normal on the East Coast as far as precipitation and from Wisconsin westward below normal on precipitation at that point. So here's my forecast for July to September. I'm afraid the core of the heat may be a little farther north than what it is over the next couple of months. And above normal area in a large part of the country, <laughs> near normal southeast and northwest. As far as uh, July to September precipitation, um, I, I agree with that below normal area over the northern plains. Um, above normal along the east coast, it does look like it's going to be a, an active tropical season again. So we'll go above normal basically along all the shorelines there. Uh, for some of those hurricanes. And that would be some good news for those folks anyway, although there's not a lot of crops growing in that area, but uh, above normal in the uh, Southwest. So I'll just take any questions that you have now. I'm not sure where we are in time. About right, looks like, okay. Well, my brother said that the, the carbon buildup in the atmosphere, and once it gets to a certain saturation point, it doesn't matter if it gets smaller, is that true? It doesn't matter what now, if it gets higher? Unless it gets higher, certain height is not going to increase the temperature anyway. I'm not an expert on that, so I'm probably going to stay away from that question. I, I haven't heard that or read that. Um, but, but like I said, there's a lot of different opinions out there. And, <laughs> and there are good scientists. There's good scientists with all different opinions on this. Uh, Similar to the pandemic, there's that uh, Barrington group of scientists who are experts in the field who said, no, we shouldn't lock down. No, we should just get to herd immunity by going through the thing. And I didn't totally disagree with that. In my family, we have both extremes. My son's not going to get vaccinated. My daughter and son-in-law have been locked down for a year now. Uh, pretty much. My wife and I decided early on we're going to live our life but stay as careful as possible. Amen. But we're not going to stop doing things. And so uh, that everybody has a different opinion. On, on the carbon, though, I would, I, I would think that it would keep getting worse if it got higher. But I, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm, that's not an expertise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in science, you just have to admit you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Actually, um, the 
throughout the temperatures in the Viking Age we had like in the 1600s and stuff? And it's it's a uh, ice store. Well, no, they do some of that. Yes, and they do tree rings, and they do oh. yes. There's all these things, but obviously you're only talking a few little examples you didn't have hundreds of stations reporting <laughs> everywhere you had zero um and so you're right that's a very good question so it's an estimate there's no question it's um it they can they can look at how high the sea levels were then and different things like that so there's a lot of a lot of ways scientists go to try to estimate it but obviously it's not as accurate as actually taking the temperature Okay, on the accuracy of forecasts, you talked about how it's very difficult. Is which part of the forecast is most accurate to you? Precip, temperature, or wind? Temperature. Temperature. Is yeah. And and wind kind of goes along with temperature. Then. Yeah. I, I mean, because it wind is created by the differences in temperatures across a region and the atmosphere trying to balance everything out. Uh, that that's kind of the basics of why there's why there's wind, but yeah, temperatures. I feel a lot more comfortable forecasting temperatures than I do precept. Okay, I've just been very impressed by the accuracy of wind forecasts for some reason. It, you know, even extended you mean out day to day yeah, or extended out. You know, they'll talk about hey, it looks like we're going to get into a a windy period in a week. Okay, you you know you're. And, and, and that, that goes, goes along with knowing where the fronts are and knowing where the, knowing where the, where the storm, where systems, storm systems, are systems are and high pressure, high pressure systems, systems are. are. And, and the models don't do a bad, bad job of that, that over a uh, five, five, six, six seven day period, period, sometimes, sometimes even, even beyond. beyond. Yeah. And, so and so you're, you're probably, you're probably right, right about, about that. that. And so, so the wind, I, I don't look at wind typically beyond 48 hours. But if you do and you notice it being halfway accurate, that's kind of nice to hear. But the Models, models don't, don't do, do bad, bad with, with the, the big picture, picture items, items, but it's, it's how, how much rain does this count yet? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's where it doesn't, doesn't do too well. How come sometimes water, weather forecast does say it's going to rain an inch? How can they say it's going to rain an inch? Well, those well, those are, are, that's, that's the computer, computer model knowing how much, how much moisture, moisture there is, is in the atmosphere, how much is being transported up from the Gulf of Mexico, which is where most of our rain comes from. Uh, here in the Midwest. It, well, when you give a general, say, one inch, it usually is one inch and a pretty good... Inch. Yes, when, when we're showing models that are showing widespread soaking rains, it, it's usually pretty accurate. I agree with you. It's the hit and miss three inches here, nothing down the road that's that's impossible to get right. But, but when you're talking a general widespread rain, you're right. The models are pretty accurate. Yeah. Okay. We talk about accuracy or whatever. So we were this morning we were talking about the old wives' tales of weather forecasts. So my mother tracks these fog days religiously, so it's going to be precipitation ninety days later. And there's tons of farmers that do it. Have you heard that? Ninety days beyond the fog day. Yeah, so we had a fog day. Ninety days later, we're going to have. Something. I'm just oh. curious if you heard it and what the. That's not what. That's not one I've heard. I've heard a lot of them. Um, that one, uh, boy, I, I don't see any real scientific good reason for that. Sure. Ninety days. You know why ninety days? But I was just hoping I could go enlighten my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell your mom she's wrong. Okay. <laughs> but I, as far as science goes, I, I don't. I don't see why that would be. But we're surprised by stuff like that sometimes. So, yeah, yeah. Um, some of the forecasters, some of the analysts that have come on AgriTalk recently have mentioned 1988 as a potential uh, that that 21 could be similar to 88. Others have even talked about 2012 and the comparisons there. What do you say to them? Is it just sensationalization like you were talking about earlier well there's there's always going to be some people sensationalizing things they may not be doing it intentionally right but just to do it there's no doubt from what i just showed with the dry areas in the southwest and more dry weather expected that if that drought starts expanding <laughs> through the plains i mean it can overtake a large part of the country because then 
if you have dry dry ground from Missouri westward, you're getting no thunderstorms developing, even if you get some golf moisture up into there. And you end up with a dry cold front coming through here. And then you start expanding the drought farther east. So it would be a concern this year. Yeah, I I hope that doesn't happen, but obviously nobody nobody wants that. That would be a concern. I don't think they're being overly sensational. Gotcha. If, if they sit there and say, I'm sure it's coming, then, well, they can't be sure. But, right. so. so when you when you have an all-out drought like 88 or 1980, what breaks a drought when it finally starts raining? What makes it start raining again? <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good question. You have to totally change the weather pattern. And it's hard to get that first rain sometimes. Uh, one of the things, I was in Saginaw, Michigan during the drought of 88, and we didn't have it quite as bad in central and northern Michigan as uh, you did farther west here. But I started wearing ugly ties for rain on TV. <laughs> so people would send me their ugliest tie, and I would wear it each day, say who it's from and everything, until we got a two-inch rainfall. And within about three weeks, we got a two-inch rainfall. And once you get that, you can break that drought in that part of the country. But it took longer to break it back here uh, into Wisconsin. But it's hard because, well, I mean, you're reading into what I'm saying there is once you get dry, it's hard to get any rain out of a dry ground. So you really need to pump a lot of golf moisture up in here and get a nice big rainfall, and then you can start eating away at the drought. Droughts, droughts are usually eaten away from the edges more than anything. So. Any other questions here? Any other questions? Hopefully I was close enough they could hear me. I started walking out of my little uh, box up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Mike, uh, once again, uh, certainly a pleasure to have you on and uh, uh, share with us your outlooks and your history and some of your experiences. Obviously, weather is an ever-evolving thing and something we all watch so closely. So. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the three-person collaboration here. <laughs>